Okay, awesome. I wanted to take a moment and actually piggyback off some of the things that Annie was saying, specifically about what her favorite parts of outdoor outreach are. And again, my name's Loretta. I'm the grants manager, and I just came on this past January. So I'm still very much getting um, my feet wet in the world of outdoor outreach. And in these first six months that I've been here, I'd have to say my favorite thing about outdoor outreach is, um, or are rather, the people. I mean, literally every day that I sign on to work, which has been all virtually predominantly, um, I leave feeling like super inspired by how kind and courageous and how hardworking and adventurous everyone is. Um, yeah, so I wanted to take a moment to just share that. And Mindy, I'm wondering if there's anything that you'd love to share about what you love about outdoor outreach. Thank you, Loretta. I'd also like to say the same thing, but I can add my own twist on it. Um, I definitely, my favorite thing about outdoor reach is the impact because I know the impact that all has made on me and because of what I've learned and what, like how I've grown because of out, outdoor outreach, I was able to make that same impact on our participants or on the little ones. So going out every day on the field and being able to inspire them while I was being inspired definitely felt like a burst in my heart. <laughs> so, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And then Mike, we'll send it over to you. We know, I know that we've learned a little bit about you in these last few minutes, but how about you tell us a little bit more about yourself, specifically how you got into the outdoor industry? Well, um, it really started growing up as a kid. Uh, I, I grew up in Sherman Heights, which is, uh, I don't know if you know San Diego, so it's, it's the South uh, West community, predominantly African-American, but it was, it was fairly diverse. I think we were, maybe 60 or 70% African-American and then uh, equal parts Latino, Asian and, um, and Anglo. Um, and it was south of Balboa Park. So we had access to the park, but I, I remember um, that's about as far as, you know, most of the folks that I knew, knew about, because, you know, there's the beach, but that was hard to get to. Um, and then there are the mountains and they're hard to get to as, as well. And so um, I grew up, one of my dad's best friend was a, was a hunter. And so we would go up in the lagunas and uh, so he did everything outdoors. And so we would chop wood, bring it back for firewood. And so I had, I got good exposure in the beginning to the local mountains, Balboa Park and, and the beach, because I went to a, uh, a couple of years I went to a, a boarding school and um, they would take us to the beach every Thursday. So I had a fairly well-rounded uh, experience. I belonged to the Boys and Boys Club of America, which is now the Boys and Girls Club of America. And so every year we would take a trip to Palomar Mountains, which was great. And so that gave me a, a definite idea of the outdoors and how we are supposed to be connected to nature. But it probably wasn't until college that um, I really got the access because I went to school in the, in the Bay Area and friends of mine were uh, outdoor activists, specifically skiers. And after I stopped playing organized sports, um, I got introduced to the, to the mountains and that was uh, you know kind of a beginning of a new passion. First time I'd seen snow, you know, being from San Diego. So that was a new experience. and. Yeah, yeah, I think just that pathway from uh, childhood all the way through having these glimpses and then getting fully immersed in it after college was really a, a, a good good exposure for me that not everybody gets, especially from uh, the area that I grew up in. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And there's so many pieces of what you share that I think is still sadly really true and relevant to some of the youth that are in San Diego. You know, it, in my first six months of working at Outdoor Outreach, I've heard stories of, you know, kids that are in their teens about to graduate high school who are just getting to the beach for the first time. So that narrative is still so true in so many ways. And, you know, that's what 
what this month long celebration is all about, you know, outdoors for all. So thank you for sharing so much of your story, as well as the experiences that you had, even, you know, later, later into to college that got you into the outdoors. So then tell us a little bit about Cirrus. Did I pronounce that right? Yeah, very good. Very rarely do people yeah. usually try to <laughs> try to put the I after the R. <laughs> yeah. uh, so Cirrus, so um, after graduating college, um, Wendy, my wife, girlfriend at the time, she, they, she talked to Santa Clara and letting her do her senior year in the mountains. <laughs> so uh, I got to spend time with her there. And then um, at some point in the next few years, um, we were in the mountains and I was on the way. And so I was, I was skiing and following snow sports just to learn about it. You know, so I was kind of just a voracious learner, a reader about what's happening in the industry and why and all that. And so I um, um, found a shortcoming in, in, in the way the boot binding interface worked. And I invented a product to protect that boot binding inter interface. And that's how the, the business started and then um, continuing to develop products ever since. And just, I was just very lucky to be at the right time at the, and the right place because um, it was when the lower limb injuries and in snow sports was on the high rise and it was a really deterrent for people to snow to ski. Um, and so the government stepped in and they, um, they made a systemized boot binding relationship that you had to adhere to by the law. Europeans had their own and the US had their own uh, bodies, but they agreed on how that interface was supposed to work. So the binding fit smoothly, so it reduced lower limb injuries. But then walking in the boot knocked it out of uh, their, their compatibility. And so I invented a walking sole that goes on the bottom of boots to protect that relationship between the boot and binding system. And since it's on the bottom of the boot, which is hard and clunky, we can comprise it out of a, a really absorbent material. So it made walking even easier and more, much more stable on ice than the boot was. And so it, it really took off. And then uh, you don't get you just to do one thing. They say, okay, now what do you, what's next? <laughs> and so we, I uh, grew through doing what's next. And luckily we attracted people who were like-minded and wanted to join in. And we wanted to invite everyone to be as um, fully in invested in what we were doing. And so we created a collaborative atmosphere that everybody gets to feel they're part of whatever we do from the start of when we're developing product to the time it goes out the door. And that's uh, it served us very well. You know, my idea was I didn't wanna work for somebody else, mainly because of the political arena that ends up in a business atmosphere. You know, people tend to wanna climb over each other as opposed to being a real team member. And we wanted to foster that collaborative team family kind of atmosphere that was more of an extension of your life than your life. And uh, it's, it's been someone that something that we found everybody wants and most people have a way to access that to enjoy it themselves and more importantly to share it with others. So we, we, we've grown from that from one product to now we're over 300 products. Yeah. That's Mike, that's I'm awesome. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think what I love most about what you just shared, um, and I'm just like tying it back to, to where this conversation started, that accessing the outdoors was, was challenging for you, right? It, it wasn't something that was super easy. And now you're this person <laughs> in the industry that's changing the outdoors. And I mean, hats off to you. That, that's really awesome. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you one more question before I send it over to Mindy. And I'm curious about, you know, in all the experiences that you had leading to where you are now, what do you find to be some of the best benefits of being out in the outdoors? Well, the best benefit is that um, kind of counter to our general uh, consciousness, 
we are animals. And we try, we tend to transcend ourselves that, no, we're not animals, we're these really satient beings, which we're lucky we have a cerebral cortex, but we are animals, we're designed to be in nature. And we've made it more convenient for our lives by creating these structures that we live in and work in. And so it really, while it gives us um, a really good safe place to be, work or play or uh, sleep, it isolates us from where we're designed to. We're designed to not just look at the air and the wind, feel the wind, be next to trees that emit, uh, you know, th to life that emits so much more than what we see. And so I, I don't think you can spend time in the outdoors without feeling that deep connection. But if you, you don't have the access, and that also starts with knowledge, if you don't even know it's there, you you get a little bit deprived. Now, luckily, you know, most communities have trees and parks, but it's nothing like the the real outdoors. You know? Thank you, Mike. Sure. All right. My question is for you. I'd like to know more. I know we talked about this already, um, but I definitely like to know like what are your inner thoughts on what do you think is the greatest barrier that young youth face when going to the outdoors? And that can be like your experience or what you've realized like mm -hmm. other under-resourced groups have faced. I think it all starts with awareness. Sometimes we get locked into this, you know, most of the disenfranchised are in, in urban areas that are very dense and very um, sparsely populated with parks. And that's about the only uh, access to, uh, that anybody has and even knowledge, you know, of course you learn about the beach and the ocean and the mountains, but if it's not right around the block, you don't know about it. So I think first of all, it's uh, awareness you know, about not only that it's there, that why it's important for us to, to be close to nature, you know, from, what it does for us by moving around in nature for our physiology, but what it does for our spirit and our minds to be in the natural environment that our, our beings were designed to be. So that's the, the not awareness is first and then is access. So again, if you're from an urban community, the access that I had was about eight blocks away to Balboa Park but anything else was a stratosphere away. And we were lucky that there were programs that I was fortunate that my parents sought out. But if you're a, a dual income family or a, a single income family or a single parent family, where most of the time the parents have is trying to put shelter and bread on the table and then help with education there's just not a lot of time for uh, what the outdoors has to offer to be part of part of the conversation so we just need um, more access and you know it's if you put awareness and then follow up with access i mean true access then you'll find many more people uh, spending time out out in the outdoors. Yeah. I definitely agree with you. I think adding on to what you just said, I've also seen in my community, um, the youth are definitely scared when they when they feel scared, they don't want to take that step out to like, yeah. you know, push themselves to like get out of their comfort zone and try something new. Mm -hmm. They they don't believe in themselves. They think like they're not good enough. And like if they've never tried it, like they'll never be able to accomplish those things but i've also i would also like to know how can the youth gain more awareness what would you do for the youth to gain more awareness hmm. okay i think that luckily this time of our our existence there there are more ways of being aware but sometimes even just deciding you want to be aware because you have um, opportunity to talk to your parents, 
the people at school, your peers, and more importantly, go online and you can learn just about anything you like. But unless it's part of the conversation, unless, unless it's part of the ethos of where you're growing up, it becomes a very low, low priority. First of all, this, you know, shelter, food and education. And then uh, the outdoors sometimes just takes a back seat, but being able to get into the outdoors, especially the wild, it, 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 it delivers something to your soul that, that, that helps you expand everywhere. And you were talking earlier about, um, or I, it might have been you, Loretta, that's talking about the um, concern of acceptance in the in the outdoors. I remember when I first started, myself and our peers. It, I don't know if if that was a uh, conscious area. We know it is subliminally and just uh, systematically. But the biggest fear was your first. Um, experience with outdoors means, and then the wild is that it is wild. And there are a lot of other animals out there that you've had very little experience with. And so just being comfortable knowing that you're going to run into a coyote or a fox or, a, you know, even some people are afraid of squirrels, you know, so it's just being able to realize that we're all the animals will learn how to, to to live in, in that nature together. I think that's one of the first barriers is that fear of, uh oh, the unknown. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on that as well. Yeah. I've, I've been on a trip and you wouldn't think about it, but there are students that are scared, scared of like the things that you wouldn't like think people would be scared of like squirrels, but it yeah. definitely does happen. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. All right, Mike, thank you. I have one last question for you from me. Mm -hmm. Actually, I lied. I have two more. <laughs> Sorry about that. But my next question for you is, what do you see as the most important reason for introducing and providing access to youth to outdoor spaces? I think the most important thing is that it makes you a more complete being by, by being in the outdoors. Um, we're, we're, we're very good about learning how to be an urban animal, but uh, we're designed for the wild. And if we're not able to at least experience it, it closes off part of our being, which doesn't allow us to, you know, fully become aware and realize as the being that we are. Thank you, Mike. All right. What message do you have for young people who want to make a difference in their community, but who might not know where to start? That's a good question. Um, I think it's again about the same pathway as learning about if you are interested in something, where do I start? And you start with the closest access you have and that's your parents, ask them questions. And when you, they run out of answers, then you go to uh, your teachers at school, uh, classmates, hey, I wanna do this. You guys heard about anything? And then your peers. And again, most importantly, if you have access to a Googleator, you, are, you are, have access to the world, right? Yeah, Google is where it's all at. You just gotta be the one to type in that question and you'll find everything right there. Everything you want to find out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Mike. I'll pass it back to Loretta now. Thanks, Mindy. And I was thinking about um, <clears throat> the barriers to, to getting outdoors being, you know, some of these animals that seem really foreign. And I mean, I'm, I'm going on probably a good like seven or eight years of like consistent camping. And still to this day, I am terrified of seeing a bear, which I've seen several times. Um, and sometimes, you know, it keeps me from wanting to go on the trip. But, yeah. you know, eventually I do go. And I mean, I guess what I would share in that experience is that the feeling of feeling that expansiveness and being connected to nature in that way is just so much more powerful than the fear of seeing animals that maybe you've never seen before. So I hear you on that. And we, we have one more question for you. 
we're living in a crazy world, right? A lot going on in a lot of different places. And is there anything in the world right now that keeps you up at night or, or worries you or scares you? And on that same note, what brings you hope in those spaces? Yeah, I, I, I've been able to condition myself out of um, overt fear. You know, uh, I think um, there's that subliminal angst that you get. Um, uh, anybody who is um, non-majority in this country knows it, but nobody knows it more than African Americans. And what we try to wash over sometimes is that the devastating impact that enslavement has when you're talking about human to human contact. And it lives completely in the, uh, the social conditioning of all the races. And, and it has probably the most demonstrated negative effect on African-Americans, but I think the, the strongest internal effect is on those who enslaved, because I, I don't think that we're designed to do that. And just that we haven't been able to face that openly shows a huge amount of, of hurt in that community that is not able to be accessed. So um, that being said, it's, it's um, I don't, I, I think, I, I wouldn't call it fear. I think that the status of America is that. Nothing to be afraid of because my belief is, and it probably goes to the hope side, is that every single human is designed to be a social animal. We are social. Now, the reality is primitive ways, we are tribal. So I mean, my family, the people who are around me, who look like me, act like me, that's the group that my uh, ancient brain is designed to be with. And it's natural for us to be wary of those we don't know, but um, it's uh, complete within our skill set to realize that that is driving us in an area that's not productive for us being social. And I think all of us, from the person with the deepest hate, who is probably the one with the deepest fear, has an access point to that love that's in that that's designed for all of us to be able to share it. So I, I don't I don't I'm not afraid of that. I think that our the human spirit's going to win, and um, we're in a time now where I think fortunately all of it's coming, uh, most of it's coming bubbling back up to the surface because you can't deal with it if it's driven underground. And so um, even the hate speech, all of that, it eventually, I think the way we care about humans is gonna win out. And it's just, unfortunately, there's gonna be some collateral damage on the path, that's all. <laughs> Mike, that was so beautifully said. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. Do you have any questions right. for us? Right, well, what I did come up with, so how many are you able to reach? I just ran the, the rough math, which means you probably handle, you know, four to 500 kids a, a year. Is that what it's, or what is, what are the access points that you're able to reach? And certainly you have a huge number of 16,000 over, you know, almost 20 years. That's yeah, great. so right now on average, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, no, that's that's it. On average each year, we're, we're just shy of 2,000 kids each year. That's great, yeah. Through all the different programming. And, you know, Mindy shared a little bit of her experience in the leadership program, which is like one of the stepping stones and building blocks. But, you know, we're, we're in a phase of our programming now where we're focusing on youth that are not just coming from schools, but they are coming... Um, from agencies that support youth in foster care or probation centers, or um, we work really closely with military youth. And with COVID last year, one of the big things that happened is our partnerships with schools, you know, had to go on pause. So we had to ask ourselves, how do we get in touch with youth? And we found one of the best ways to do that with school and job closer, closures was to get into the neighborhoods. So now we've opened up these new doors to invite youth and their siblings 
and their yeah. parents and their grandparents um, yeah. to engage in the outdoors together. So while we're just shy of 2,000 kids each year, we know that number is going to grow. That's great. Yeah. So I think that's the only question I had. And just really applause for you doing that because it, it takes that type of dedication and sacrifice um, to make it happen. And um, I wish we would have a program where, where we used to have a, a, a draft for people to go fight people. It'd be nice to have a draft, you know, that everybody was supposed to spend a couple of years in community service. And I think we would learn so much more about each other and, and grow from there. Absolutely. Well, Mike, thank you so much. Um, I know you had mentioned, mentioned to Annie at the beginning of this call that you're going to join us on an outdoor program. So I'll be looking out for you. I think you read into that. I said, <laughs> I, I like the way you close the deal. Yes, I'll be happy to do that. So we just find, find the time and we'll find the time. Awesome. Uh -huh. Mindy, anything else you want to share? Yeah, Mike, it was such a pleasure to hear about your stories and your impact. And also, I just want to say I love your energy and your bright smile. It definitely uplifts my day. But I feel very honored to be here to speak to you and with Loretta as well. So thank you so much for your time, Mike. Thank you. You guys are all inspirational. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Well, thank Take you, care. guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. All right. You too. Hang with. Take care. Bye.